While Canada is often celebrated as a beacon of tolerance and freedom, few realize that during the early 20th century, a wave of fascist ideologies quietly permeated its borders. How did these ideas find fertile ground here, and why did they take hold? Hey everyone, and welcome back to Compelling History. Today we'll be continuing our series of videos exploring the history of fascism with a look at Canada's surprising fascist past. We'll begin by taking a look at the rise of fascism movements in Canada during the early 20th century, before finishing with how the country avoid the same dark fate as countries like Italy or Spain. Also, make sure you stick around until the end to learn about the resurgence of Canadian fascism. If you're new here, we release videos every week exploring specific historical events or figures as part of a larger monthly topic. And if you like this video or learned something new, consider giving this video a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on the final video in this series, The History of Fascism in America. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get into the video. In the shadows of the Great Depression, Canada faced a reckoning. Out of the despair emerged a dangerous attraction to ideas that promised strength at the cost of freedom. Fascism in Canada took root primarily as a fringe ideology emerging in various movements and political parties during the early 20th century. Unlike in Europe, Canadian fascism never gained a mass following, but it saw its most significant surge during the 1930s, fueled by economic despair and fear of communism. Canadian fascism shared core elements with European fascism, such as nationalism and authoritarianism, yet tailored itself to Canadian concerns, emphasizing anti-communism, xenophobia, and British loyalty. A critical aspect of Canadian fascism lay in its nationalist appeal. Figures like Adrien Arcand, the self-proclaimed Canadian Fuhrer, framed their ideology as a means to protect traditional Canadian values against external threats, including immigration and foreign influences. This version of fascism cast itself not as foreign, but as a patriotic safeguard for Canada, an appeal that attracted some Canadians who felt disillusioned with the state of democracy and economic instability. The Great Depression hit Canada hard, leading to widespread unemployment and poverty which left many Canadians questioning the efficacy of their democratic institutions. For some, fascism represented a strong, decisive alternative. Leaders like Arcand capitalized on these anxieties, portraying fascism as a movement capable of restoring order and national pride. Archon's National Unity Party, founded in 1938 as a merger of various smaller fascist groups, became the most prominent fascist organization in Canada. Originally, Archon established the Parti National Social Chrétien du Canada in 1934, promoting a virulently anti-Semitic and authoritarian vision inspired by Nazi Germany. His rhetoric resonated with those who feared communism and the perceived erosion of Canadian identity. By using symbols like the Union Jack and rallying around the slogans Canada for Canadians and King Country and Christianity, Arcand crafted a uniquely Canadian brand of fascism that attempted to appeal to both English and French Canadians. The rise of fascist sympathies was not limited to Quebec. Other groups emerged across Canada such as the Canadian Union of Fascists CUF, in Winnipeg and Toronto, inspired by Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists. Chuck Crate, a young CUF leader in Toronto, organized the party's propaganda efforts, promoting the idea of a corporatist, British loyal state. The CUF emphasized economic restructuring and proposed abolishing provincial governments in favor of a centralized authority. Although CUF leaders publicly distanced themselves from German and Italian fascism, their rhetoric often targeted immigrants, Jewish communities, and leftist movements as threats to Canadian society. The influence of European fascism also spurred other fascist-aligned groups. The Ku Klux Klan, although not traditionally fascist, gained support in Western Canada by promoting white supremacy and anti-immigrant sentiments. Their alignment with fascist ideals reinforced an exclusionary nationalism that sought to reshape Canada in a more racially pure image. In British Columbia, the CUF further expanded fascist ideas, led by Colonel Arthur Smith, who echoed the xenophobic and anti-communist sentiments common to fascist rhetoric. Italian Canadians also experienced the effects of fascism in unique ways. Filippo Salvatore's fascism and the Italians of Montreal highlights the complex relationship between Italian immigrants and Mussolini's Italy. Organizations like Fasci Italiani Alestero promoted Italian pride but were closely tied to Mussolini's fascist state. As Salvatore documents, some Italian Canadians felt allegiance to Mussolini's Italy, seeing it as a symbol of pride and identity. 
However, this allegiance often sparked tension within the community, dividing those loyal to Mussolini from those who embraced Canadian values. Despite these movements, Canadian fascism never gained widespread popularity. By the late 1930s, as World War II loomed, fascist ideas began to lose appeal as Canadians witnessed the horrors emerging from Nazi Germany. Archon's National Unity Party, which once drew large crowds, faced growing resistance. Anti-fascist organizations held counter-rallies and protests, exemplified by a significant counter-demonstration of 10,000 people at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, opposing an NUP event. The war marked a turning point, as Canadian democratic institutions, supported by a vigilant press and an active civil society, prevented fascism from taking deeper root. Yet, Canadian fascism's appeal during the Depression era serves as a reminder of how social and economic despair can create fertile ground for extremist ideologies. Though fringe, Canadian fascism revealed the vulnerabilities in society that can be exploited in challenging times, and the lingering sentiments of nationalism and exclusion periodically re-emerge in Canadian politics. By the war's end, Canadian fascism was largely discredited, yet its impact on Canadian society endures as a complex chapter. The episodes of internment, anti-Semitism, and nationalist fervor shaped the experiences of communities across the country, leaving lessons that resonate in the face of contemporary challenges. Could fascism ever have truly taken root in Canada? For a brief, unnerving chapter, its advocates thought so, launching a plan to secure power that would face fierce resistance. In the early 20th century, fascist movements began appearing across North America, including Canada, inspired by the authoritarian ideals that had captivated Europe. Canadian fascists, influenced by the Nazi party and Mussolini's fascists, sought to replicate these ideologies in Canada, envisioning a nation rooted in extreme nationalism, racial purity, and authoritarian rule. Central to this effort was Adrien Arcand, a fervent Quebec nationalist and admirer of Hitler. Arcand founded the National Social Christian Party, which later merged into the National Unity Party in 1938. He saw himself as a defender of a pure Canadian identity and envisioned a Canada modeled on Nazi Germany, promoting authoritarianism, anti-Semitism, and racial exclusivity. Archon's goals included establishing a single-party state that would enforce fascist principles and eradicate leftist ideologies. Archon's strategy for power relied on three main tools, propaganda, paramilitary organization, and alliances. His skill as a propagandist fueled his movement's growth. He used newspapers like Le Patriot and Le Combat National to distribute anti-Semitic, nationalist, and anti-communist rhetoric, framing these views as rational responses to Canada's economic struggles. Fascist publications often resembled legitimate news sources, hoping to make fascist ideals more palatable to ordinary Canadians. Arcand also organized rallies and public gatherings that borrowed from the fascist playbook, uniformed displays, nationalist symbols, and powerful slogans to project unity and intimidate opponents. Fascist groups even built paramilitary units like Archon's Blue Shirts, who were trained to intimidate, protect rallies, and signify the movement's readiness for action, potentially violent if needed. These fascist factions courted young men and veterans frustrated by economic stagnation, offering them a vision of order, purpose, and nationalist pride. The fascists in Canada also attempted to expand their influence by aligning with other right-wing groups. Arcand hoped to build a cross-regional coalition, particularly in Quebec and the Prairies, hoping to merge nationalist factions and absorb smaller organizations under his control. By doing so, he aimed to create a coalition capable of influencing policies, swaying public sentiment, and challenging established institutions. Fascist leaders attempted to infiltrate political parties, labor unions, and religious organizations, targeting conservative factions to bring them under fascist influence. However, these efforts largely failed. Most institutions resisted, with the Catholic Church in Quebec, for instance, rejecting Archon's overtures despite its conservative base. Ironically, despite their disdain for democracy, Canadian fascists sought legitimacy through elections. They ran candidates in local elections, aiming to gain a foothold in government. But while they promised nationalism and anti-communism, their platform ultimately failed to appeal to voters, remaining on the fringes due to their divisive rhetoric. Marcon's ambitions, however, faced formidable opposition from diverse sectors of Canadian society. Many Canadians saw fascism as a betrayal of national values and a threat to democratic ideals. Jewish communities, who were particularly targeted by Archon's rhetoric, mobilized against him, working with leftist and labor groups to challenge fascist messaging. 
Jewish organizations like the Canadian Jewish Congress organized counter-protests and public events to expose the discriminatory and dangerous aims of fascism. These coalitions distributed anti-fascist literature, held teach-ins, and used the press to counter the appeal of fascism. The Canadian media also played a critical role, with newspapers like the Toronto Star and the Montreal Gazette publishing editorials that condemned fascist activities and exposed the bigoted, violent intentions of leaders like Arcand. Journalists investigated fascist rallies and reported on their connections to European movements, warning Canadians about the dangers of adopting fascist ideology. Additional anti-fascist publications emerged, dedicated to countering fascist propaganda and revealing the movement's foreign extremist agenda. By linking Canadian fascism to Nazi Germany, these publications aimed to show Canadians that it was not patriotic, but instead an authoritarian threat. Despite its conservative leanings, the Catholic Church in Quebec also largely opposed fascism. Although some nationalist factions sympathized with Arcand's anti-communist stance, most Catholic leaders saw fascism's authoritarianism as a threat to the Church's influence in the social fabric. Their rejection deprived Arcand of a crucial ally in Quebec, where he had hoped to rally support for his vision of a Christian nationalist state. Labor unions and leftist organizations were among the fascist movement's most determined adversaries. Groups like the Communist Party of Canada and socialist organizations saw fascism as an existential threat to workers' rights and democracy. Unions organized counter-rallies, distributed anti-fascist literature, and disrupted fascist gatherings. Leftist publications highlighted fascism's anti-labor stance, warning workers that a fascist state would crush the labor movement and undermine workers' autonomy. Through these actions, they effectively framed fascism as an enemy of working Canadians, further isolating the movement from mainstream society. Grassroots efforts also played a significant role in resisting fascism. Community leaders organized neighborhood meetings, teach-ins, and educational events, particularly in areas with high immigrant populations, where people were already aware of fascism's dangers. These local, decentralized efforts were essential in keeping fascism from taking root and ensured that Canadians remained vigilant against authoritarian ideologies. Marcon's fascist vision included an authoritarian, racially pure Canada allied with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Fascist leaders imagined a one-party state led by a supreme figure, with all opposition eliminated and a centralized government controlling every aspect of life. They sought to strip Jewish Canadians of their rights, proposing policies that would exclude them from public office, education, and the economy, and even considered establishing concentration camps. Beyond anti-Semitism, their goals included suppressing leftist ideologies, controlling media, banning unions, and forming a militarized society loyal to the state. Betjeman's The Swastika and The Maple Leaf shows how Canadian fascists' ambition was thwarted by public opposition, government action, and the resilience of Canadian democratic institutions. Though their movement posed a genuine threat, the united efforts of Canadians ensured that fascism could not establish itself in Canada. The story of fascism's brief grip on Canada is one of unexpected alliances, quiet rebellions, and a determination to safeguard democracy. But how did it fall apart? The Canadian fascist movement emerged as an unexpected echo of rising totalitarian regimes in Europe, pulling support from groups disillusioned by economic hardships, societal divisions, and the appeal of a strong, unified state. In the 1930s, Canadian fascism, embodied by groups like the Canadian Union of Fascists and Adrian Arcand's National Unity Party, drew from the same influences that spurred fascism in Europe. The movement promised an idealistic, unified Canada, stripped of what they saw as divisive foreign influences and centered around traditional nationalist ideals. However, beneath the allure of unity, the movement's rhetoric was filled with xenophobic and anti-Semitic sentiments, setting a dangerous tone within the political landscape. Supporters, often drawn from working-class communities, felt left behind by the government's seeming inability to stabilize the economy during the Great Depression. Many saw fascism as a route to control the chaos, Rallies, pamphlets, and speeches, many of which mirrored Nazi propaganda, circulated with promises of a better life under authoritarian rule, targeting groups they blamed for societal ills. Prominent members, such as Adrian Arcand, openly promoted anti-Semitic conspiracies, rallying support with divisive, inflammatory claims. Arcand's publications, Le Patriot and Le Combat National, circulated virulent, racist propaganda accusing Jewish communities of communism, corruption, and control of Canadian media, all with the intent of isolating these groups from society. 
For a time, the movement gained traction, especially in regions facing economic and social strains. Yet resistance was equally strong. Canadians, while enduring economic hardships, remained largely opposed to the fascist message. Socialists, labor unions, religious leaders, and many average citizens actively countered the fascist rhetoric. Jewish communities especially were vigilant, organizing boycotts against businesses sympathetic to fascists, producing educational pamphlets, and holding events to counter fascist rallies. In places like Montreal and Toronto, citizens rallied against the growing fascist presence, organizing counter-protests to disrupt fascist gatherings and expose the movement's discriminatory intentions. The Canadian Jewish Congress worked tirelessly to counteract Archon's hate-filled narratives by lobbying for government intervention and organizing public awareness campaigns. Meanwhile, labor unions and leftist groups joined the effort, seeing the fascists as direct threats to workers' rights and democratic freedoms. They disseminated anti-fascist literature and organized gatherings to stand in opposition to the fascists wherever they appeared. For many Canadians, opposing fascism became an act of civic duty a demonstration of their commitment to democracy. Meanwhile, Canadian fascists sought to make their presence more acceptable by linking their ideology to patriotism. Arcand and his followers appeared in militaristic uniforms, mirrored European fascist salutes and symbols, and emphasized traditional Canadian values in their propaganda. Attempting to gain respectability, they forged alliances with right-wing groups, veterans associations, and conservative religious factions, attempting to exploit fears about communism and dissatisfaction with the political system. However, even within these conservative groups, Arkan's extreme rhetoric, his open admiration for Hitler and insistence on a Christian nationalist Canada proved divisive, with many rejecting fascist militarism and seeing it as un-Canadian. Arkan's public admiration for Hitler and attempts to align Canadian fascism with Nazi Germany alienated him further. Canadian newspapers regularly condemned his statements, portraying him as a dangerous radical unfit for Canadian society. In cities and towns, fascist groups like Arkan's National Unity Party formed paramilitary units known as Blue Shirts, modeled after the brown shirts and black shirts of European fascism. Members wore uniforms and held drills in public, presenting an intimidating display of their intentions. To the Canadian public, already wary of such displays, this militaristic posturing was seen as an affront to Canadian values. Local law enforcement began monitoring the group's activities closely to prevent violence as tensions frequently arose between the blue shirts and anti-fascist activists. The press, labor unions, and community organizations condemned these groups as a threat to democracy, comparing them to European fascist militias and questioning their true motives. The controversy surrounding the fascists' actions deepened when Arkham began propagating conspiracy theories that depicted Jewish Canadians as part of a larger communist plot against Canada. This rhetoric was widely rejected by Canadians, who, despite the nation's economic struggles, saw the baseless scapegoating of Jewish communities as both unwarranted and divisive. Media outlets took a strong stand against these conspiracy theories, discrediting them as unfounded and denouncing Arkham as an extremist. Canadian newspapers ran scathing articles against Arcand, frequently highlighting his open admiration for foreign dictators and painting him as a fringe figure with no place in Canadian politics. Public backlash against Arcand and his followers only intensified as suspicions grew that his sympathies lay more with Nazi Germany than with Canada. By the onset of World War II, Canadian fascism's popularity had waned significantly. The movement's rhetoric, increasingly at odds with Canada's support for the Allies, alienated many of its previous sympathizers. The government responded by banning the National Unity Party under the Defense of Canada regulations, which gave officials the power to curtail activities deemed a threat to national security. Arcand and other prominent fascist leaders were detained without trial, spending the war years in internment camps. Arkand, along with other detained fascists, spent much of the war at the Petawawa military base, with similar detainments in New Brunswick for other fascist organizers. The arrests were met with widespread approval, and Canadians rallied behind the government's swift action against groups seen as dangerous to national unity. The public rejection of fascist movements continued after the war. Reports of Nazi atrocities that emerged as the war concluded further diminished any sympathy for fascism in Canada. The stigma surrounding fascism grew so intense that even former supporters found it nearly impossible to reintegrate, with many facing social ostracism and difficulty rebuilding their lives. 
Arkand attempted to rekindle his political ambitions after his release, and even ran for office, but his image was irreparably tarnished. Though he continued to publish writings, Arkand's days of influence were over. His death in 1967 marked the end of any substantial fascist activity in Canada. With the National Unity Party fading into obscurity as Canadian society moved toward greater tolerance and pluralism, Betjeman's account underscores how Canadians, despite the hardships of the Great Depression and the fears of war, rejected fascist ideology as incompatible with their democratic values. Through grassroots opposition, public condemnation, and government intervention, Canadian society effectively curtailed the fascist movement. As promised earlier in the video, we'll also take a quick look into the resurgence of Canadian fascism. In contemporary Canada, fascism has evolved from its overt manifestations in the 1930s to more subtle and insidious forms. Modern neo-fascist groups often employ coded language and indirect messaging, making their ideologies less immediately recognizable. These organizations exploit divisive issues, leveraging social media and other platforms to propagate narratives that pit citizens against one another based on ethnicity, religion, or immigration status. By tapping into economic anxieties, nationalistic sentiments, and fears of societal change, they attract individuals toward more radical beliefs. A notable example of this evolution is the so-called Freedom Convoy of 2022. Initially presented as a protest against COVID-19 mandates, it attracted individuals from various political backgrounds concerned about government overreach and economic challenges. However, the movement quickly became a breeding ground for far-right ideologies, incorporating elements of Islamophobia and anti-immigration sentiments. This convergence of grievances and extremist views has led to a growing voter bloc, rallying behind certain political figures, with some individuals even seeking political office themselves. Despite these challenges, resistance to such ideologies remains robust in Canada. A network of anti-hate organizations and advocacy groups actively monitors and combats these movements. Civil rights organizations, grassroots coalitions, and government-led initiatives like the Canadian Anti-Hate Network work diligently to expose hate groups and educate the public on recognizing fascist rhetoric. Canada's legal framework also plays a crucial role, with laws against hate speech and discrimination helping to curb open calls for violence and prejudice. While Canada is not immune to the resurgence of fascist elements, the country's active populace and legal measures serve as significant deterrents. Global movements against fascism and authoritarianism further highlight the risks these ideologies pose to democratic values. By remaining vigilant and supporting inclusive policies, Canadians play a crucial role in ensuring that fascism does not gain a lasting foothold in the nation. Thank you so much for watching our video on fascism in Canada. We hope you enjoyed this video and are looking forward to the final video in our series exploring fascist movements around the world. Don't miss our video next week exploring the history of fascism in the United States of America. Before you go, make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more history-related content. This channel isn't possible without the support of viewers like you.